Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Online Peace Science Colloquium. Um, it's October 28th, uh, 2016, and today uh, we have a presentation from Michael Kenwick, who's a, a graduate student in ABD at um, Penn State University. Um, he will be presenting today on um, is civilian control self-reinforcing, right? I just remembered that. That's correct, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Emily Ritter, and I'm the coordinator of the online speaker series. And uh, we're joined today by three excellent discussants. We have Clayton Tyne, who's an associate professor at the University of Kentucky. We have Jonathan Powell, an assistant professor of political science at the University of Central Florida, and Andrew Little, assistant professor of government at Cornell University. So in case anyone is not familiar with how this goes, we're going to start with a presentation from Michael Kenwick, and he will go for about 15 minutes, and then um, we will open it up to questions from our panelists. Um, if anyone who's watching would like to take a look, the paper is uploaded to our website, which you can find from the Peace Science website, and uh, follow along as you like. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks for putting this together, Emily. Thank you mm -hmm. to Peter for helping set this up. And thank you to the discussants. Uh, but to get us going, I'm going to give a kind of very quick uh, discussion of the paper, which is titled, Is Civilian Control Self-Reinforcing? And it's part of a larger set of projects that I've been working on on civil-military relations, which studies the dynamic of how civilian elites interact with the military which is inherently an interesting uh, dynamic because civilian elites are often seen as having a monopoly on de jure authority in the state, whereas the military, of course, is a monopoly on the use of coercive power, which then begs the question, how do civilian elites get uh, the military to remain loyal uh, to civilian rule? And this brings us to the issue of civilian control. Now, civilian control has been covered a lot in much of the literature in civil military relations, international relations, comparative politics, and American politics. But within the context of this paper and this presentation, I'm focusing on civilian control as it relates to two uh, dimensions. The first is whether civilians monopolize uh, executive decision making within a given state, which is to say that the military isn't charged with any high level executive decision making. And the second more fundamental aspect of civilian control is that the military abstains from using its coercive power to directly intervene in politics through something like a coup or a threat of coup. Uh, now, this is an important issue through much of the developing world. Uh, the military has often intervened in politics. We can look and split the world into states that have and have not experienced coups. We'd find that about half of the world has experienced a coup, a little bit less. But of that proportion, 80% have experienced recurrent coups. If we look at things like non-constitutional leader turnover or non-constitutional leader change, about 60% of the time, that's the result of military intervention in politics. And if we look at democratic regime collapse, depending on what data you use, that's the result of a coup or military intervention between two thirds and three quarters of the time. So clearly this is an important issue. And happily, there's been a lot of literature that's addressed this issue. Uh, some looks at civilian control as an independent variable and some looks at civilian control as a dependent variable. And there's also been a debate about how we can best conceptualize or think about civilian control, what the core features of this concept are. Uh, and that is the literature that I'm going to try to address today. Uh, specifically, one thing that's been lacking up to this point in this literature is that uh, generally we don't have a great measure of civilian control that operates over a long stretch of time and space. Uh, generally, uh, these studies have been limited to small end analyses of regions like Latin America. Uh, and so I'm going to try to address this in kind of two parts. The first is that I'm going to try to construct some measures of civilian control with a wide spatial and temporal coverage. And the second is that I'm going to try to pull some uh, competing arguments from that literature about how we can best conceptualize civilian control. And uh, from these kind of two competing uh, concepts of civilian control that I'm going to put forth, I'm going to try to adjudicate between the two using measurement modeling techniques, which is to say I'm going to come up with two competing measurement models that pair with theoretical expectations from the literature, and then adjudicate between them using some basic validation procedures. And I'll conclude by taking stock of what we've learned theoretically. So the first way we can think about civilian control is a self-reinforcing concept. And this is drawing upon some of the institutional literature that's evaluated any political institution where the equilibrium behavior becomes more stable over time, we can think of that as a self-reinforcing institution. So how does this relate to the study of civil military relations? Well, we can begin by conceptualizing civil military relations writ large as a political institution that encompasses all of the formal and informal rules linking civilian and military elites. Uh, we can think then of civilian control as an equilibrium behavior that's uh, threatened by exogenous shocks. 
So at the outset of any regime, we can think of civilian control being at least provisionally established and that the military has tacitly accepted these civilians' right to rule. Uh, but this might break down as the result of a number of things that would drive the military from the barracks, which would include things like an economic crises or battlefield collapse or even contentious elections. Uh, so in this way, we could think of the strength of civilian control as being determined uh, by how robust that equilibrium behavior will be to those exogenous shocks. And the self-reinforcing view would argue that the strength of civilian control is in particular determined by the balance of institutional power, the extent to which civilians mon monopolize executive decision making, and two, the shared beliefs of military elites. Uh, and this is going to determine whether military elites believe they can succeed in actually implementing a coup. Uh, so we can begin by thinking of any military intervention in politics as a coordination problem among military elites, where they're not going to actually attempt to carry out a coup unless they believe they can get sufficient support from their allies. So in this way, whether the coup is attempted at all is going to be determined by the beliefs of military personnel regarding the behavior of their colleagues. If they don't think the coup will be supported, they're going to be unlikely to attempt it for risk of sparking a uh, internal military conflict. Now, how do they... Uh, actually establish these beliefs, we can think of them as coming from previous observed behavior within a political regime, and this will be determined by kind of the past strength of civilian control. Uh, so as a result of this, we could think of civilian control as being self-reinforcing. If the military elites are looking to the past and finding that there's been a history of military intervention in politics, they might believe that they can succeed in carrying out the next intervention. Whereas if the history of a particular regime is characterized by civilian control, we should expect that there'll be more pessimistic about their ability to actually intervene in politics successfully. So the expectation here is that civilian control should strengthen as it persists and weaken as it continually breaks down. Now this view is not new. This is actually dates back to uh, the kind of traditional civil military relations literature like Huntington and before who talk about things like professionalism being the belief of the military that their place is outside of politics. And it's also been incorporated into more recent formal treatments by people like one of our discussants, Andrew Little, uh, where military behavior is kind of a function of learning what they've seen in the past. Now, I'm going to contrast this self-reinforcing view with a static view of civilian control. This is kind of a more institutionally oriented uh, view of civilian control. Here, this can be seen as taking basically the two starting points from the self-reinforcing view that civil military relations are conceptualized as a political institution and that uh, civilian control itself is an equilibrium behavior. But here, history isn't a necessary component, and civilian control is only uh, determined by the balance of institutional power within a political regime. Now, this might at first sound like a strawman argument, but it's actually adopted in much of the civil military relations literature, which emphasizes things like democratic institutions as being the primary determinant of civilian control. For example, if we look at a lot of the empirical analyses of things similar to civilian control, like military rule or democratic rule, uh, oftentimes, uh, civilian control is proxied through things like democratic institutions or single party institutions and autocracy. And it's assumed that the level of control should be both high and consistent in those regimes. So uh, here we have our two basic expectations. We have the self-reinforcing view that self civilian control should strengthen as it persists and that history matters. And the second static or institutional view that uh, all that matters for civilian control are the strength of political institutions within any particular regime. And here history would not be a necessary condition. So what I'm going to try to do is adjudicate between these two using two competing measurement models. The first is going to measure civilian control as a static measure, which is going to capture that institutionalist view, while the second is going to uh, capture civilian control through a dynamic model, which is going to capture that self-reinforcing view. And then I'm going to adjudicate between those through a series of base and predictive validity checks. So both of the models will have in common uh, the basic structure, which is that both of the models will be a latent variable model of civilian control. And this begins with the assumption that we cannot observe civilian control directly. Instead, what we observe are manifestations of civilian control, or more often civilian control being much like the dog that didn't bark, manifestations of weak civilian control. And so what the model is going to do is take a series of indicators of weak civilian control and back out an estimate of how high or low a particular country in a particular is on this trait. So the first thing that I need to do is identify uh, kind of the manifest variables and the manifestations of weak civilian control. I'm going to run through these very quickly. They're obviously discussed in more detail in the paper, but I look at this, basically three categories of indicators. The first relates to leader traits, which is whether the leader has experience in the military, whether the leader holds a military rank, and whether the defense minister is actually a member of the military holding military rank. All of these are going to capture the extent to which the military is involved in executive decision making. 
Next, I can look at the level of military intervention in a particular regime. I proxy this with whether there's been a recent coup or coup in the last five years from two of our discussants' data. I'm going to look at whether the military was actually involved in putting the leader into office. This will capture the kind of puppet leader who's a civilian nominally, but actually is uh, relying on the military to remain in power. And finally, I look at whether a given regime is preceded by military rule with the assumption that uh, this is going to be a regime inheriting a, a politically strong military. And finally, in the extreme, we can picture the kind of complete breakdown of civilian control or the antithesis of civilian control as being military rule. I use a series of indicators from the literature to capture this. Uh, and finally, I include a militarism index from Jessica Weeks, which captures uh, basically the degree to which uh, the civilian, sorry, the degree to which the military is involved in executive decision making. So each of these are going to be a manifest variable, which we could think of why as being caused by a latent trait, which here is denoted with theta. Uh, they're linked between using a ordered logic link function. There's also a difficulty in discrimination parameter, which is similar in a uh, standard regression to a intercept or a series of cut points and a slope. Uh, and so I'm gonna solve this as a system of equations for uh, theta. Now that is what the two models have in common, but the next thing I have to do is incorporate our expectations as to whether or not civilian control is a static concept or a self-reinforcing concept. I'm gonna do this through the application of Bayesian priors, which is a natural way to incorporate prior theoretical information. Uh, the static model prior is going to be applied to every country's estimate of civilian control, and it's gonna give all of them the same prior of a normal zero one distribution, a standard normal distribution. Uh, what's important about this prior is that all of the items are treated as interchangeable. The only thing that differentiates between them is the uh, manifest variables or the institutional variables. So history isn't taken into account, and all we're concerned with here are institutions. This contrasts with the dynamic modeling approach, which is actually going to take history into account through a random walk prior. The way this works, every time a country or a regime enters into the data, it's given that normal zero one prior. Uh, but for every subsequent year, this year's prior is a draw from last year's posterior, and there's also an innovation variance built in through sigma. What's important about this is, one, it's going to directly take history into account through the prior, and second, as we'll see, uh, observations that have been high on civilian control for a long time are going to generally be given higher estimates in dynamic model, and countries that have been low on civilian control for a long time will generally be given lower estimates. So having run these models, the first thing we need to do is uh, basic face validity check to determine that both of them are essentially doing what I would expect based on these competing theoretical expectations. I go into this in more detail in the paper, but just for simplicity, I have a basic plot of the density of both of the distributions for both of the measures. The uh, dark is the dynamic estimate distribution, and the light is the static estimate distribution. These are country years running from 1945 until 2010. Higher values correspond to higher civilian control, and lower values correspond to lower civilian controls civilian control. And the notable thing about this plot here is that peak you see with the static estimates. These are regimes that have adopted fully civilianized institutions. And so because of that, the static model will treat them as fully civilianized regimes with very high civilian control, whereas the dynamic uh, model will smooth over that peak of observations. And for those that have been high for a long time, you're going to see these larger estimates, and that's the portion of the density shifting off to the right in the dynamic model. And those that have only been in that state for a short period of time will give them lower estimates. So after having generated the models, the next thing that we need to do is determine which is actually doing a better job capturing reality. And I do this in two ways in the paper. The first is a series of posterior predictive checks. And this sees which of the two models is going to do a better job reproducing the data that was used to make it, reproducing the manifest variables. About I'm not three minutes, Michael. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to present that today because it's not very uh, interesting, frankly. Uh, but you can see in the paper, the dynamic model is better in all of the uh, posterior predictive checks. The second is an analysis of mid-initiation. And here the idea is we're going to see which of these two uh, measures is going to better explain a concept that we think is theoretically related to civilian control. And we have a pretty strong literature that says weak civilian control should lead, lead to an increased propensity of mid-initiation. And so what I'm going to do is estimate three models of mid-initiation from 1946 to 2000 uh, with a directed diet year unit of analysis. I'm going to include in one model the dynamic measure, in one model the static measure, and in one model the weeks militarism index is kind of a uh, control case for an existing measure that's pretty close to what I'm trying to generate here. And what we find here is the uh, effect from each of those independent variables on mid-initiation, which is the y-axis. 
And we can see that all three of them positively or negatively predict mid-initiation, as we would expect. But the dynamic model uncovers a much stronger relationship. And what we can infer from this is that actually taking history into account uh, allows us to uncover stronger relationships, which is to say, by ignoring history, we may have been underestimating the effect of civilian control. Another interesting thing to note here is whatever fit statistic you would like to evaluate how well the model is explaining variation, the dynamic tends to do the best with pseudo or squared or log likelihood or whatever you would like. So to conclude, the validity tests seem to suggest civilian control is in fact a self-reinforcing concept. Uh, we should care about this because building these measures is allowing us to bridge a gap between theory and empirics instead of study of civil military relations. We've had a lot of work saying that history should matter in civil military relations and that things like professionalism and norms matter, but we can uh, evaluate this as a kind of first empirical test that suggests these theories were in fact correct and that history is an important component of these political institutions, that this equilibrium in behavior is going to be changing as the result of prior uh, history. Uh, and so in this sense, we could also see these measures that have produced as evidence of hitherto untested theories of civilian control. We can also step back a little further and look at how this might inform the debate about whether or not coups can be a good thing. There's a literature that argues that coups can sometimes be good if they topple autocratic institutions and put in democratic institutions. And while that might be true in the short run, the results here seem to suggest that this will also erode the kind of expectation of civilian control in the future, which may in turn breed political instability. So with that, I'm going to conclude and turn it over to the discussants. Thank you. Excellent, perfect timing. Couldn't have been better. <laughs> um, so who wants to go first? I mean, right, Clay. I'll jump in. Uh, excellent okay. job. I enjoyed your presentation at Peace Science. I enjoyed this. It almost seemed like you're reading off of something because that was pretty fluid, man. That was a good uh, <laughs> presentation. Uh, yeah, next time I want to see you live. With the <laughs> So, I don't have uh, any notes. I've just practiced this a million times. Yeah. <laughs> the one, you know, I just kind of a bigger catch-all question. I mean, what's what's this being pitched to? What's it for? Are we looking at sort of a, a chapter of a book? Are we looking at special data feature sort of thing? Just standalone article? We're hoping for a... What are you looking at um, for an outlet? So uh, in terms of the outlet for this particular paper, I see it as an article, but it is built into a larger research program that I've been conducting, where the first step, we can think of, uh, if we care about civilian control, the first thing we need to do is establish what we know about civilian control as a concept, which is what I'm trying to do here. And the other projects I'm working on are looking at the causes and effects of civilian control. Um, but I am doing this in a kind of article-based setup. Um, so I see this as contributing to a larger research program, but also a standalone. Um, and I don't see this as an exclusively a data feature, as you said. I see this as actually making a theoretical contribution in terms of incorporating what we know about whether and how history matters in civil military relations. So I do think it does make that theoretical contribution, too. So can I follow up on my own? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's really good to know um, because it, it alters a little bit. Um, if it was going to be a special data feature sort of thing, I was going to tell you to shorten it quite a bit. Um, we're going full-blown article, I think. Part of what would be helpful is that stuff you ended with to bring some of that to the beginning a little bit, um, because what would I would need to to like this paper for an outlet like JCR or something like that. Um, I would I would want to make darn sure that you're speaking to a, a very broad literature, um, that it's not just about the handful of us that that care about coups and civil military relations. But I think you could make a, a clear connection to um, you know, you could run with the, the empirical tests that you did um, with MIDS. Um, you could speak more to comparativist crowd um, interested in this stuff. But I think, uh, again, how you ended it with the implications, you could do a better job bringing that to the beginning um, just so the reviewer, when they get to the actual meat of the paper, has a better mindset on the impact of what 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 you're doing and why we should care. Uh, Michael, do you want to respond to that or should I take Jonathan? I'd just say oh, that's really well taken and that's something I think I can do a, uh, a better job in the paper. I, I do have stuff to say <laughs> on that as you saw, but getting that earlier on I think is a good idea. Okay. Jonathan. Okay, so very cool paper, a really good read. Um, I'm going to build a little bit on what Clay was saying in terms of taking some of the stuff from the end of your presentation and from the end of the paper and moving it up towards the front. But I'm going to do it in a bit of a different way. 
Um, so the paper itself in your presentation, you, you talk about the importance of it from a scholarly perspective, like, you know, like bridging the, you know, the gap between theory and empirical work, which there is a huge gap there currently. And we have a lot of assumptions and we haven't really tested some of these assumptions. So you're doing a really good job there. Um, I'd like to see some sort of discussion of the policy relevance aspect of it, right? Um, so what, so if, if I'm either a leader or if I'm a member of a government who's recently experienced something like this, what can we take away from your paper to help us come up with, you know, kind of policy prescriptions? How do we move, move forward and not have to deal with this stuff in the future? Or, or both, um, look at this in terms of U.S. foreign policy, right? Um, so if the U.S. wants to do things like promote better govern governance and promote civil, better civil military relations in the developing world, how are we going to go about doing it? Now, on that front, one of the really cool things that I like about this is you can take this in as many different directions as you want, right? So, you know, I know that you've done some work on rivalry stuff, obviously. The U.S. might be interested in how stable or reliable are these, um, or not rivalry stuff, but yeah, alliances and all that. How stable are allies going to be? Are we going to see a Turkey, right? And if we do have some fears that a place like Turkey might have a coup, you might be able to give us a better idea of one, where to look, where you might expect this stuff, but then also um, what can we do to try to prevent these things? And then um, beyond that, another general point that might be helpful is you give us a good idea of kind of like the overall picture. I'm kind of curious if you did any exploration of the data to try to figure out if um, the findings, particularly as they relate to something like mid-initiation, are they being driven by some specific component like, um, you know, like a military executive or, you know, defense ministers, an active member of the military? So I was just kind of curious if you've broken, you know, if you've broken it down a little bit and looked at those sorts of nuances. Yeah, uh, so I'll respond to that in two parts. For the first, I think you're right about the policy relevance. And here again, I think one of the things that I can bring in is there are some implications if we adopted the kind of institutionalist view, then all we need to do for stable civil military relations are build the right institutions. Whereas the implications for the self-reinforcing would be much broader. Here, we'd actually need to worry about keeping the military in the barracks for a long period of time and that the institutions are going to be unstable at first. So. Uh, I didn't think about the alliance connection, but I think that's actually a really good one that I want to explore further. Um, in terms of breaking up the kind of analysis of mid-initiation into the component parts of the measure, I have done that. And as you would expect, generally we find that all of the components possibly predict. We know from Jessica Weeks' work that the regime type indicators do in Slater and Lie. Uh, we know from Sexer and Horowitz and Stem that the military experience does. With a few of the indicators, the results, the coefficient is often positive, but the results don't always hold because of limitations in the temporal scope or the spatial scope of the data. Um, so if you do break it up, you see kind of a consistent relationship, which I would expect. I've got Andrew. Oh, uh, you're muted. <coughs> Still muted. There we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so I guess so this is sort of sort of on the the policy point you made that well so so I was going to speak a bit more broadly theoretically um, I mean I think sort of a, one of the biggest things to think about um, is, is so I think that there's like a lot of different possible theories that one could come up with um, that are going to look very similar uh, and I'm not sure which one of them act, which ones of them like actually represent what you would call a self reinforcing process. Right, so if we just sort of like take the take the observation from your you know your like figure one that you get more coups earlier in the regime. Well, so I can sort of think of a lot of reasons or why you get clustering. I mean, so that could just be there's a completely theoretically uninteresting explanation for that, which is that structural factors are just autocorrelated, <laughs> and you know like you can basically I think get a lot of these empirical predictions from from I mean kind of like a non theory theory <laughs> that just says like whatever it is that that leads to coups that's autocorrelated. Um, I mean, yeah, then, so, so, you know, you can think about more, more learning processes. So, you know, are we kind of like, and I think sort of like the learning you're trying to get at is, you know, whether, I mean, like all this stuff, the problem, sort of all this stuff can, can get kind of circular very quickly that it's like, uh, I'm going to be learning about whether, you know, other people don't want to intervene in politics, but, but really we could be learning about a lot of things over time. You know, we could be learning about, um, you know, is the current leader, able to resist a coup. We could be learning about, you know, what are the best ways to stage a coup. 
Um, and so, you know, we could be sort of learning about that. And like, so that, that learning, I mean, is that a self-reinforcing process? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, and then, yeah, and so, you know, I mean, I can, I, I have like a list of like eight different theories that, you know, that seem like you get at this. Um, and so, um, and so, so the, the, I think the connection to the, the policy point there is that if what you're going to say is, you know, what we need to do is just keep the military in the barracks, well, I think that actually depends on, on what your theory is of, of why history matters. Um, and I'm sure we can write down theories that, that um, sort of like match what you're actually observing in this data, but are going to have very different implications, um, say, for that particular point and for other things. Right. So I think that's a, that's a really great point. And that's one limitation of the project is that uh, I do develop a model that ha captures civilian control as a self-reinforcing process, but getting at the micro foundations of what's causing that is something that I think, uh, in part, we're going to need additional research on, particularly if we're talking about the uh, perceptions of military elites. It's an area for uh, future studies. Uh, what I would say, however, is that I think if we do look at this as a learning process or a kind of a professionalism process, we would expect exactly uh, what I find. Uh, and so I imagine, and I haven't done this yet, but one thing I could do is look at determinants of future coups if I uh, incorporate the kind of structure of the data with the dynamic model properly. I would expect that the civilian control measure should, will still have an effect even after controlling for kind of the unobserved uh, fixed factors, you know, the fixed effects model, or even some of the structural factors that we've found. Uh, I don't think those would necessarily be incompatible. And uh, I think that the just building these reinforcing processes and the measures to begin with is a necessary first step to test these kind of broader expectation that institutions aren't static, that institutions are going to have these temporal processes. Uh, Clay? So, like, I, I, I really like the previous comment. That's something that um, I was thinking about, too. Um, and I like that you're sticking behind your learning enormous argument because uh, I think you're right but I also wonder if there's room to expand that um, the idea so the, so I think a reviewer is going to say that there are lots of things that time is going to influence and your argument may be one of those executives also over time might just get better at uh, avoiding coups or something like that too I mean a lot of things happen with time so do you have to be wedded with this norm argument? Um, could you just speak more generally that, that, that this measure that you're developing is capturing what you think is happening and also other plausible things that could be happening um, over time? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's an area I can I can make more explicit in the paper is that the norms are a component of this. I think that the argument you're putting forth about the executives getting better at putting putting down coups, I don't think that's inconsistent with this expectation. Um, you can also think of the expectations of society at large, and I talk about this briefly in the paper, as determining whether or not the military elites are going to try to instigate a coup, because they're going to uh, arguably need at least some degree of public support, and if they could expect mass protests, then that will increase the relative cost of the coup. Uh, so I think that's right, that this is, uh, the norms are one component of a larger self-reinforcing process. Uh, and that's something that I can, I can do a little bit better job scoping out the paper. Well, okay. I, I just don't want to underplay what, what I'm thinking in terms of revision though, because I mean, I, I, I like exactly what you just said, but I mean, you're talking about taking really essentially a one, one part theory and making it now a three part theory. Like that's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I think it's needed and I think it'd be important, but um, I don't think we're just talking about like just adding a few sentences to like the, the protest thing. I think you're dead right, right? Um, but that's not a normative thing. That's a rational thing. That's a cost of um, the military behaving sort of thing. So I think that you're talking about expanding the theory quite a bit. Um, and I think that would be really useful. Yeah, I do think that's an area where um I need to update, and I, I think you're right that it, it's not a matter of a couple of sentences. Uh, but we can, with the normative argument, one way to think about norms is a shared belief or a shared expectation. It could be a shared expectation among military elites about the consequences of future behavior. So I don't see that as uh, inconsistent with a rationalist approach. Uh, and that's something I do think that I need to uh, make some changes on in the paper to make it more clear that this is, uh, this fits with the kind of rationalist analyses of civil-military relations we've seen, uh, but it's also consistent with the kind of traditional 
normative arguments that go back further. Can I interject here just to <clears throat> to clarify what I think that the that that Clay and Andrew were suggesting is that uh, I mean, forgive me if I if followed incorrectly, but it seems like they're suggesting that you've got a lot of different theories put together into this one measure, right? Is there something that you could do with the measure and the approach that you're using to kind of um, distinguish between possible motivations for the self-reinforcing nature, right? Whether it is normative versus, you know, a million other things that Andrew has suggested could be the case that makes them self-reinforcing, or is that something that you would have to do uh, post hoc with different kinds of theory testing, right? So is that something that you could do with this project and this particular measurement approach? Distinguish between these possible mechanisms or is it something that you would need to start with this measure and then uh, Use this measure in order to distinguish between those the theoretical mechanisms predicting outcomes Sure, uh, so I think that the answer is both I think there are some things that I could do within the confines of this current analysis to start to adjudicate between them uh, Through a little bit of what I said with a kind of rigorous analysis of, of things like Q onset uh, but another approach that uh, I could take, that I have actually started to take, is trying to unpack the argument using different modeling strategies. So one of the limitations of kind of the latent variable approach, if you're to keep the measurement-based approach, is that you, uh, the right-hand side of it has to be manifestations of civilian control. So it's not, at least thinking about it right now, immediately clear how I conclude outside factors that are kind of these unobserved, omitted, you know, resources or you know, geographic location or what have you. Uh, but one thing that you could do that I've started to do is look at how these dynamic processes uh, alter as a function of regime type. And so we can look at whether or not the kind of self-reinforcing processes as a function not only of time, but also of time and institutional structure. Uh, and that's something that I have started to do as an outgrowth, uh, but that would require future work. Um, so I think there's some that I can do inside what I see it's a self-contained analysis here, but there's also work that I'm currently conducting to address this issue fully, more fully elsewhere. Cool. Jonathan, you have your hand up? Yeah, and, and building on that, one of the things that I think would be interesting is try to identify situations where you might think that the leader is going, is going to face some sort of threat of a coup. So one thing that I would suggest is, so right now you're looking at regime age, right? So like how long has this specific regime um, type been there. Um, what happens if you start to look more at how long has the actual leader been in power, right? Because a regime can be there, can be very stable for a very long period of time. They can do what Clay referred to as getting really good at preventing coups, right? But if you change leaders, that might not go with it, right? So there are all kinds of examples where you have a leader who has effectively coup-proofed, but then either they resign, they go away, protesters force them out, or natural death is a really good example of this, I think, all of a sudden any guise of civil military relations falls apart, right? So Togo looks good on this stuff up until Nisingbe dies um, around 10 years ago. There's immediately a coup because the military wants to determine who's coming into power after him. Um, but it had been something like 40 years since they had seen something that would very, you know, like really, really, really overtly scream, we have very bad civil military relations here. I mean, then, you know, Guinea would be another example of this where Conti had basically stabilized the regime, but as soon as he's gone, the, con the country's basically been in civil military chaos since then, right? So I think if you, that you might be able to leverage um, this difference between stability of the regime versus stability of the leader. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure what the best way to do that would be, but I do think that you will find instances which, in which you should be able to say we should think the institutions should help maintain maintain stability through these periods of leader transition and then figure out, is it actually doing that? Does that make sense? I think so. Uh, one thing that I could do uh, in the paper, I look at kind of what the determinants of the differences between the two models are. Uh, and one thing I could do to begin to address this would be to look at these kind of, uh, I could look at leader duration as well. And I would expect that the dynamic model would start to produce higher estimates the longer the leader's been in power. Because in some regimes, as you point out, the in some regimes, the institution should hold over the leader turnover. In other regimes, the leader has made the institutions. It's, it's kind of that Spolek-style argument. Um, so I, I think I could begin to address that by looking at how the models perform differently as 
both a function of leader tenure and uh, maybe its interaction with with regime type. Uh, would that do you, do you think that would be a starting point for your comment, or am I missing the boat? Yeah, it would be. It definitely be a starting point, and that's something that I was I was thinking about while reading this, but I can't really come up with a great suggestion for it. I'm not I'm not sure what the best approach is, but um, I'll definitely think about it more and let you know if I can think of something that would be better than the vague suggestion I've given you. <laughs> I've got one finger from Andrew. Uh, oh, there we go. Off mute. Mm -hmm. um, so, sort of going a bit back to Emily was saying, but I mean, I think um, if you're if you're going that a measurement model like this, um, I guess we, we can maybe we'll veer into the more empirical stuff soon. Um, is going to be better suited for the kind of general question of um, you know does history matter for you know among the set of seven different possible explanations than distinguishing between them. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, we, we have a lot of different ideas that are, they're going to look similar in terms of, um, in terms of what they predict in like the broad patterns of how, you know, a bunch of different indicators are going to track over time, uh, things like that. Uh, if you want to get more specifically into questions of, you know, is this, you know, am I, are we learning about the strength of the leader versus are we learning about, um, how willing my colleagues in the military are to coup. Um, like, I, I just don't see how, you know, some, a broad indicator like the one you're constructing is really gonna help us uh, tease out those things. And so for something like that, you know, then then you're probably gonna need to think of kind of more precise research designs that, that you know, th thinking through more carefully, you know, what are the different predictions of those, those two ideas, um, you know, not that they have to be mutually exclusive, um, and then thinking, you know, so a little more precisely about that. Um, so I think if, you know, if, 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 if the way you're thinking about what to do with the paper is, okay, you know, I've like run, run all these models now, what do I do to say what we've learned from this? I would sort of push you more towards the framing this as like, you know, we have a lot of different reasons to think why this might be a self-reinforcing process. You know, norms is one of them. Here's a bunch of other ones. Um, here's some evidence that indicates that, you know, this is the, this kind of class of explanations is, is better. Yeah, so that would be my like, short-term recommendation. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I think that this is essentially narrowing the black box and that it's establishing that the self-reinforcing process is taking place, but more research is definitely needed to adjudicate between the kind of precise mechanisms uh, that might be causing it both either individually or together. Um, so that said, the one thing I would say in defense of the approach is that this is something that uh, we haven't done, we haven't known about civilian control. We've been modeling, uh, in a lot of late, large end work at least, civilian control as essentially a static process whenever we just rely on these recent coup dummies or these regime type dummies. And we often think about political institutions as static or unchanging in terms of these regime type indicators, even if you model it as a, as a one-shot game, which we're doing less. Um, but I think building a measure that's going to actually incorporate this dynamic process and self-reinforcing is a, is a necessary step that I think uh, we haven't seen. Um, but I would think that, wouldn't I? <laughs> uh, Clay. I think I'm unmuted. Yep. Uh, so yeah, different direction on this question. Um, Go for it. So the, the decision to I mean, so yeah, what you have to do with a, a measure like this is to actually show us that it matters, right? Um, which you did in two ways, and I'm curious about the second way where you showed us that it, uh, civilian control has a negative influence on uh, mid-initiation, uh, which I thought was fairly clever, but of course you know the ideal scenario here is that you could show us that everybody else found one thing and you found something else, right? So what you end up showing us is that yeah, we've got slopes and they're all negative and they're all significant, but yours is a little bit stronger substantively than the other ones, right? Um, I was just, so I was kind of curious what other things is, that you may have thought about, try, whatever, what other empirical models you thought about plugging this into, um, just so, I don't know, it, tell me what you were thinking and then uh, perhaps maybe there are others that would be better or I'll just let you talk. Sure. Uh, no, so I think that's a great point. Now, uh, in terms of finding something altogether new uh, with the measure, in part with the pr predictive validity checks, I'm trying to reproduce a finding to actually validate the measure. So if I was finding something theoretically counterintuitive uh, in terms of a validation check, that would actually make me nervous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I get that. So I think that the, the change in the substantive size of the effect, it's something different, but it also uh, is new. Though, 
to to expand on the point further, I am looking in a separate analysis of unpacking this relationship between uh, civilian control and dispute initiation more fully so that I can look at how it's a function across different regime settings. And that's something that we haven't known from the literature. We often assume that civilian control matters in personalist regimes or military regimes. But what I'm uncovering right now is that it actually matters quite a great deal in democracies and party-based regimes. And the effects there are actually stronger. Um, and then another analysis that, I'm, that I've conducted, I'm comparing this to kind of other relationship sizes like the democratic peace and how that would actually relate. So there's a lot to be done there and there's a lot that I'm currently doing. Uh, but within the confines of this paper, the goal has been to have a finding that is theoretically stable enough that I feel comfortable reproducing it as a validity check. And so that's why I am going to the work of Slater and Lion Weeks and others um, and relying on that as being a a relationship that's sufficiently strong that I would be made nervous if my measures didn't reproduce it, because that would suggest I'm capturing something else. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I misspoke. I, I didn't misspeak. I was, I was wrong. You don't want something completely different, right? Ideally, you'd, you'd show. Well, I mean, wouldn't ideally you'd want to show that other scholars were making type two error, essentially that um, we all have the same theory in mind, but your measure captures uh, what what they're not, but what 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 their their measure didn't capture so you're saying that yeah we're all right theoretically um it's just that this measure is actually showing what we all expected to be true but i mean did did you so 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 i ask if if you tried this validity measure on other models or other ideas um you gave us some some external ones that that aren't essentially validity checks right like you talked about democratic peace these are these are new theoretical ideas. Right. Um, did you try anything akin to this mid initiation where I, I so we, we'd want something where that uh, I mean, it's tough because the the coup is an independent variable is hasn't been studied as much as it as a dependent variable. Um, but have you tried or thought about other uh, baseline models that you could plug this into as a validity check? So as a validity check, uh, I've I've stuck primarily to mid for the reasons I've said. I have looked at a few others. Uh, I don't want to look at coup onset per se. Uh, I have to be careful on how I would do that because of I the temp yeah yeah. Uh, one thing that I did look at as another test is to look at how they affect coup success or failure. Because uh, one kind of interesting implication might be that if we are thinking about the dynamic measures capturing, we can think of the level of civilian control today as kind of my prior belief that a coup will succeed. Um, and the results there show somewhat what you would expect, uh, that as civilian control increases, the probability of coup will succeed decreases. There is a parabolic relationship, um, but it's, uh, at least in the, the models that I've currently run, it's not quite statistically significant um, after you incorporate the uncertainty in the estimates. Uh, but one thing I think is neat about that that fits with theory is that we would expect a coup is really likely to succeed um, either when civilian control is, you know, if civilian control is really, really weak, they're going to try to attempt the coup and they're going to succeed. If civilian control is really, really strong, they're not going to uh, attempt the coup at all. But if you're in this middling level, then the military elites, I would argue, are going to be in a difficult strategic environment um, where they're going to have to try to guess how their colleagues will respond. And if the norms or the expectations are consistent, uh, that's where you'd have the greatest capacity for kind of strategic miscalculation. Uh, so I actually have a, a little blog post uh, on the monkey cage where I talk about the Turkish coup in this framework. Um, now, whether that would be uh, a validity test might be uh, a bit much, but uh, that's another kind of area. Of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to look at this as it relates to uh, repression, but I have not done that yet. Yeah, that was the only other one that popped into my head as a potential alternative or a second to mid initiation, but. Yeah, and that would be that would be interesting, and that's something I'd like to do because there's been that piece that found that military regimes aren't a good predictor of repression. This is the uh, Hill and Jones, and I, I'm cautiously optimistic that that might be a function of the measure, not the concept. Uh, so better measure, better finding, but I haven't done it yet. We have an open queue. <clears throat> Uh, oh, sorry, I can't see your hand, <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, so you mentioned the uh, the monkey cage thing with the Turkish case. Uh, 
and I had read it back when it first came up. So I was just kind of curious. Um, like one of the things that I mentioned earlier about this was actually, you know, trying to look at, did there seem to be any indicators in particular? And I know that in, in the monkey cage post you had looked at, I know that you'd looked at Turkey where it falls in the data and it was somewhere around like the median or something in terms of civilian control. Right. So I was just c kind of curious if there were any measures specifically on here, like on table one, were there any of these that Turkey might otherwise seem pretty bad with, you know, like something that might have been a red flag to think, okay, they might be hanging around the median, but given this specific factor is present there, then that might be something that we should pay closer attention to. So, yeah, actually, this is something that I uh, scrapped from the presentation for time. Uh, but what I like about Turkey is that, at least on the indicators I have, which are admittedly the, the kind of course indicators that exist, but on the basic indicators, we have Turkey with very civilianized institutions. Mm. Um, and so if you look at the static model, it gives Turkey the highest possible score because it's, you know, it's fully civilianized on face value, whereas the dynamic model is the one that sticks Turkey kind of in the middle of the pack. And what I think is interesting about this from a theoretical perspective, perspective is we can actually go out and prior to the coup, see these kind of uh, static versus self-reinforcing views become manifest in academic and policy-based discussion of Turkey. So there are a lot of people out there saying that Erdogan had successfully defanged the military and that it had become this kind of strongman government where civilians had achieved control. And in some regard, it had, and on an institutional level, it had. But what differentiates between the two models is the, the history that the dynamic model is taking into account. Um, and so I think that's the factor that differentiates Turkey. Um, while there's certainly, I think if we had more granular measures, we would uncover some areas where the Turkey still had, or the military in Turkey certainly still had influence. But on a kind of broader level, uh, I think that one of the critical factors with Turkey is that it hadn't quite yet built up that tradition of civil, civilian rule. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and one of the things that I like about the, you know, the, just the basic idea of what you're trying to do here, where generally we do use really crude measures like, you know, years since last coup attempt or, you know, X number of coups in the last so many years. And, you know, it's been decades for Turkey, right? And then uh, beyond that, there was, there was the, you know, kind of the funny business in the 90s, well, you know, what you might call a soft coup, where the military might not have overtly been, you know, tanks on the street overthrowing the government, but they were very certainly behind the scenes, you know, kind of pushing political actors to try to change the regime. Um, so, I mean, I'm assuming that's going, that's going to be popping up in things like the weeks militarism index and things like that. Um, but yeah, anyway, I was just kind of curious if there might be other things going on there, like, you know, like active military defense ministers and the like, which I don't know a whole lot about Turkey per se, but yeah, I'm just, yeah. I think Before that would be, answer, uh, Clay had a two finger on that. Uh, well, let, you go ahead and answer, and then okay. I'm going to tell you what I think more broadly about the discussion you two are having. Okay. <laughs> How about that? Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Right. Excited. Yeah, no, so the, the most recent year we have data for Turkey is 2010, but on that year, even the defense minister position, everything with Turkey was coming up. Uh, all the data that were available is coming up zero. The um, weeks indicator, while uh, it is probably the best that we have in terms of granularity amongst those existing input measures, uh, for democracies, uh, there's not much variation at all there uh, because it's, I think on democracies, that measure is only differentiating between uh, the leader. Um, so at least on, on the kind of standard institutional indicators, Turkey was civilianized. But right. again, I know that's not the case in reality. So, so, I mean, what I want you to do is take that last five minutes and package it and put it in the paper. Because uh, that was super interesting, mm -hmm. um, and it brought your the differentiation between what you're doing and previous uh, measures to life, and it's an interesting, relevant case that puzzled the heck out of a lot of us. And so, uh, yeah, man, like, <laughs> like you, you and John are just sitting here rapping about Turkey, and I'm just like riveted. And and so I started flipping through, and I figured I must have missed the section about Turkey, and I didn't find it, man. Like, it's not in there, right? No, it's not right now. And it what's nice play. is we recorded this so you could remember all the things it's that you said. <laughs> you can go right. uh, uh, but yeah, I, th I, I just want to hammer away at the point of how interesting that is to the listener, but the reader's going to feel the same way. When you bring a single case to life, 
to differentiate between what you're doing in previous work, uh, that's just absolutely golden. Um, would be fascinating in the paper. Yeah, I think that I think I will I, I will do that. Uh, I think that might be a good way to to open the paper. Um, I mean, it, Andrew, you've got the, uh, the the piece I've seen on how to structure an introduction in political science articles, and that the anecdote is one of them. I think I might have just found my anecdote. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jonathan, and then Andrew. Yeah, yeah really sorry, can you, can you see my, my, um, my video it doesn't seem to be working? Oh, no. Uh, I can see you, um, and we can hear you. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll let, um, sorry, someone else is going to. Okay, Jonathan, and then okay. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, so that was going to actually be my, kind of like my biggest suggestion, like something I think you absolutely have to do, is just, you know, tell some sort of story. And I think Turkey would be something that would be useful um, just because it was something that, while Turkey certainly wasn't like completely civilianized in the way we would think about it, it was something that shocked us. It was obviously something very important um, in a lot of these coups, you know, increasingly um, they're in more kind of uh, marginal cases, you know, like they seem to be over time increasingly less developed countries. Every now and then you have an Egypt or a Thailand, but usually it's going to be like Guinea-Bissau or Burundi or something like that. Um, so I'd absolutely encourage you to use a case to kind of frame this. And Turkey might be a pretty good example of it, especially if what you're saying here, where the static model says there's basically no problems at all, right? And then the dynamic model, it might not look particularly bad, but it at least tells us that it certainly isn't going to be good. Um, another thing I was curious about with the Turkey case, and you know, ultimately, you are going to be limited by the crude nature of, of the, a lot of the measures that you have to rely on. But I'm just kind of curious, you know, does it matter if all these other things in Turkey might have been a zero, does just the sheer like size of the military matter? And I know, you know, like there have been different arguments, you know, like the size of the military, you know, and even in mine, my paper, like I say that this can help increase like coordination obstacles and stuff like that. But I think there is a case to be made by the sheer fact that they have an army of over half a million people, you know, that it might be worth thinking about something like a last well, like garrison type effect where there, it is such a big part of society that it might have an important story to tell within this. And to be clear, I think size of the military could go a variety of different ways, theoretically, depending on the specific context. But um, that's something I'd encourage you to think about, and, you know, just because it's a big, it is a big part of society more generally. Uh, so on that, uh, I think, well, I'll handle the, the turkey issue part. I'm actually going to turn on screen share for a minute. This is a slide that I removed from the presentation this morning, which maybe I should not have. Uh, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. uh, here's turkey in the static model and turkey in the dynamic. And here in the static, you can see it's as high as Costa Rica, which if you didn't know, does not have a military. And in the dynamic, it's very much in the middle of the pack. Um, and if you took all the countries in the world, that's roughly where turkey would sit in the highest static middle of the dynamic. But just in case you were curious what that looked like. Um, but in terms of your second point, the size of the military, those types of indicators have been something that have been a bit of a, a challenge for me from a modeling perspective, because I completely am on board with you that they matter uh, in a lot of really important ways. But both with the size of the military and something like a you know, coup proofing or a counterbalancing indicator, they're difficult to incorporate into the measurement model, which assumes that these are manifestations of civilian control. And here we can think of the size of the military, while it definitely has an effect on coordination and coup success, it's also, it could be that you have a big military because you have achieved a sufficient level of civilian control and you can afford to build that without having to worry. Uh, and similarly with coup proofing, you might think that this weakens the military, but you only adopt that strategy if you have a politically strong military to begin with. And so there's a challenge from a modeling perspective to put that into the measurement model because the relationship between that indicator and civilian control is, uh, somewhat more complex than I think I'd be able to model at least in a simple fashion. Um, so that's why, I don't know if this is a full, you know, this fully addresses your point. Oh, no, and, that's a, to, and, and I'll agree sorry? with you. Like, I think it might be actually, I don't know if it would necessarily be impossible, but I think it's even tougher than you're suggesting. So even, you know, the size of the military itself, that, it, that in and of itself is gonna be dependent on a variety of other things like security concerns and things like that, which ultimately you're going to try to explain later, you know, stuff like MIDs. 
So yeah, I'm not sure that you can do anything with it, but at the end of the day, this is the thing that fascinates me about a place like Turkey, is even if you do have zeros through all of those other categories, and even if we do have institutions, um, is the sheer fact that so many people in the country are soldiers and so many people are veterans, you know, does that do like a last will type thing where you're going to see them basically automatically either have a say or feel like they should have a say in politics? And I don't, you know, there's obviously no easy way to try to address that, but it's just something that kept keeps creeping through my mind with the turkey. Why don't we hold on that and let Andrew, because we're running close on time. So how about Andrew? Um, so can people hear my, my like, my video is doing totally crazy things, but am I, am I on? <laughs> well, we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it, it, this looks like something for a movie of like flashing lights everywhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, so this is uh, maybe um, sort of slightly different than the previous discussion. But um, so I think a, a worry I have in, in the, the empirical analysis is I'm not quite sure how to distinguish between um, there sort of truly being a dynamic process here, which I mean, theoretically, I believe, but let's say I'm skeptical about that and don't believe that. Um, and so I think someone who's skeptical about that, what they could argue is that, that sort of all you're getting from this dynamic model is that you're kind of using more data. And that really like the reason why when you go from say, you know, the militarism index to the static model to the dy dynamic model and you like start uncovering bigger effects, that you're just kind of incorporating more data sort of no matter what the the theoretical reason is that you know there's say a link between between mids and military relations um, you know like no matter what the truth is as you incorporate more data you're gonna sort of get stronger estimates um, and so you know you, even just from the fact that like so I'm guessing that the dynamic model you know incorporates more than whatever the last five years of coup attempts so obviously in the turkey context that might matter that this this dynamic model is just is just soaking up more information there um, and so I'm not quite sure how I think you should respond to that. Um, so hopefully you have a response to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, and I'll, I'll try, and then you can tell me uh, how I did. <laughs> um, okay. So the, this is an argument that I, I'd, of course, be familiar with and I'm sympathetic with. Uh, but what I try to do to get to establish that the dynamic model is doing better because it's capturing the self-reinforcing, not just because it has more information, is one, looking at where the models diverge. And so that was the, the plot. I don't remember what figure it was, where I find that it, it, the models are most different when you have these very old regimes, very kind of democratic and old regimes. Uh, and two, in the uh, section where I look at the posterior predictive checks and looking at how well the models reproduce the data, I find that the biggest difference are the cases where uh, they all have kind of zeros on the indicators or where they're fully civilianized. And I find that as the regime ages, the dynamic model is doing better and better. And so for me, I'm taking that as evidence, not just that the dynamic model is doing better by incorporating last year's posterior or by removing or narrowing the confidence intervals or credible intervals in this case, uh, but it's actually doing better where we would expect it would do better if this is in fact a self-reinforcing process. So that was how I tried to get at that critique is actually if it were just a matter of providing more efficient estimation, then we wouldn't necessarily expect the dynamic model to be doing better on the subset of cases that are highest on civilian control. So I wonder if, um, I mean, it, I think uh, it just seems very, like none of that sounds crazy, but it all seems kind of ad hoc. So I think it would be useful if you could um, point to some, you know, more, more kind of methodological people talking about, you know, a priori, what are the, the kinds of checks we should do to distinguish between models like this. I think, I think that would be useful. Yeah, and I can, I can look more, more into that. Um, the posterior predictive checks are pretty common, though. The, uh, looking at the region is, is something that I was doing. Um, but often we think, again, that the dynamic model should do better because it should narrow the credible intervals. But here we're both getting different estimates, substantively different estimates, mm -hmm. and that it's so essentially, I, I, I think that I was beginning to get it with it there, though I will uh, take you up on that, that point about uh, trying to think of some more uh, kind of creative means to, to go about this. So that's something I will work on. Well, we are running up on time. So um, it does, do any of our discussants have anything that they'd like to make sure that was said before we, before we peel out here? Thanks so much, Emily and Mike. Very yeah. good job. Um, Mike, do you have anything you'd like to say in final comments? <laughs>
Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for the time. This has been a tremendous opportunity. This has been some of the best feedback that I've, I've gotten. Um, and it was, uh, I've spent a lot of time citing you guys. So it's been a lot of fun to <laughs> chat about it. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and thank you for your feedback. Awesome. Well, this was excellent. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, presenting your work and sharing it with us. Um, again, anyone who would like to take a look, the manuscript is up on the Peace Science Colloquium website. So uh, Google it and uh, go read the paper and send Mike more comments. Um, you can also uh, comment on the YouTube page if anyone has questions or ideas. And hopefully, uh, Mike will be able to, to check it out. And we will, uh, uh, and I want to thank Clay and uh, Jonathan and, and Andrew for their time reading the paper and their excellent comments. I really appreciate it. Um, so we'll be back again in uh, two weeks on November 11th when Anita Godis will present on women combatants and the politics of gender based repression in the Syrian conflict. So thanks to all, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks, Emily. All right, bye everybody. See ya. Thanks.